is there such a thing as a perfect piece of music? A perfect piece of art? I think I've found one, and let me tell you about it. It's a pretty bold claim to call a piece of music absolutely perfect, but the first prelude from the Well-Tempered Clavier is an absolutely perfect piece of music. The Well-Tempered Clavier was compiled in 1722, and it's sort of an encyclopedia. Bach wrote one prelude and one fugue for each of the major and minor keys, giving us 24 preludes and 24 fugues. On the title page, Bach inscribed that this was written, quote, for the profit and use of musical youth desirous of learning, and especially for the pastime of those already skilled in this study. The well-tempered in the title refers to the tuning of the instrument. It does not mean the equally tempered system that we use today, but it's closer to something that we would call mean tone now. So accidentals were still out of tune a little bit, but it was meant as a tuning system that would allow the keyboardist to move in and out of one key area without being restricted heavily. Now, precisely how box keyboards were tuned is up for debate. Some have argued that the hand-drawn loops at the top of the page were actually coded instructions by Bach on how to properly tune the instrument. The well-tempered clavier was circulated during Bach's lifetime. However, as with most of his music, it fell out of fashion after he died. Regardless, it had a big impact on other composers. Composers like Mozart and Beethoven made arrangements of the fugues. Before Beethoven was a teenager, he made his name around Vienna by being able to play both books one and two of the Well-Tempered Clavier from memory. The conductor Hans von Bülow was quoted as calling the Well-Tempered Clavier the Old Testament of music. Beethoven's sonatas were the New Testament. Now why this piece? This piece is one of the most successful pieces of classical music ever. Virtually everyone has heard the tune. Charles Gounod famously wrote Ave Maria, the melody that is very popular on top of it. And it's also really successful because to play it on piano, it's pretty easy. It's in C major, it doesn't modulate too much, and it's the same chordal pattern. So any beginning pianist can tackle this piece pretty easily. So it's hard to talk about the music without listening to it. So here's a recording of the piece with my harmonic analysis underneath it. I've uploaded this analysis to my website, which you can download for free. And it might be helpful because I'm going to be referencing measure numbers throughout the rest of this video. And it'll be pretty hard to keep straight in your mind if you don't have that in front of you. First thing to notice, like we've already said, is how easy and simple the piece really is. It's one chord per measure, there's simple arpeggiation throughout, and it never really breaks away from that pattern. There are three places where there's a non-chord tone, and they all use the pitch C, which is the tonic of our key. There's a passing tone in measure 23. In measure 26 and 27, the C is a 4-3 suspension, and there's another 4-3 suspension from measure 30 to 31. 
Measures 15 through 19 are an exact transposition through measures 7 through 11. Originally, Bach used measures 7 through 11 to modulate to the key of G. Then in 15 through 19, he goes from G major back to C major, our tonic. If we look closer, we can divide this piece up into five sections, depending on where Bach modulates. The first is C major. The second is that modulation to G major, the dominant. The third is a modulation back to C major, the tonic. And then for measures 20 to 24, there's a transitory passage where Bach gives us F major, G major, and then back to C major. This is a harmonically tense moment. Because the use of fully diminished seventh chords suggests a minor key, whereas half diminished leading tone chords suggest a major key. And then the last section is from measures 24 through 35, where we get dominant and tonic pedal points. If we condense that down, we can see where the bass line travels throughout all of the modulations. This is a descent of a perfect fourth, a perfect fifth, another perfect fifth, and then another perfect fourth. A structure that is the same forwards as it is backwards is called chiastic, and that comes from the Greek letter chi. So the term chiral derives from the Greek word hand. Now the concept here being that just as your left hand and your right hand are mere images of one another, right? Identical and yet opposite. There is also a rhetorical form called a chiasmus. This is where lines are related to each other through inversion. Some examples are Matthew 19.30, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be the first. There's a quote from Voltaire. The instinct of a man is to pursue everything that flies from him, and to fly from all that pursues him. And the chiastic structure is still around. Even in the movie Mean Girls, they use a chiastic structure. Laura, I don't hate you because you're fat. You're fat because I hate you. Now there's one odd thing that you may have noticed with the harmony in this piece. In three places, Bach used a major, major seventh chord. These are measures eight, measure 16, and 21. A major, major seventh chord is a chord that is a major triad and then a major seventh stacked on top of it. This is quite an extraordinary harmony to be using in the early 1700s. Usually with a major chord, you would have a minor seventh on top and treat it as a dominant because that allows you to modulate. But it was exceedingly rare to have a major chord with a major seventh, but Bach does it in three places. So the main question going throughout the rest of this video is, what's up with that harmony? The golden mean is an ancient idea that has spanned philosophy, the arts, and mathematics. Philosophically, it was used to point to the idea of perfection. Artistically, it was used to point to beauty. And as a mathematical formula, it can be stated as a plus b is to a as a is to b. It can be described as a number, and the Greeks represented it with the letter phi. This golden mean, this phi, this number is related to the Fibonacci sequence. The sequence is created by adding two of the numbers together to produce the next number in the sequence. How this is related to the golden mean is that if we divide a number by its following number in the sequence, then we get a number that approaches closer and closer to the golden mean the further we go. The golden mean is perhaps most famously depicted by this spiral. This is created by taking squares with the sides equal to numbers corresponding to Fibonacci numbers. One of the most important things to know about the golden mean and this spiral is that it's a repeating phenomenon. It doesn't happen just once. One golden mean section doesn't mean much, but a multi-layering of this pattern reveals a complex web of relationships. Back to the ancients again, they found this relationship depicted everywhere in nature. Because of how common the golden mean was, this gained a metaphysical significance. Now, it wasn't just external nature that showed these proportions, but also our own human bodies. The length of your hand is a golden section compared to the length of your arm. Even our faces display the golden mean to a very striking degree. This is Aishwarya Rai. She's an Indian model and actress and has been called the most beautiful woman in the world. If we measure her face from the chin to her hairline, the golden mean lies at the center of her eyes. The golden mean of that golden section is to her nose. If the calipers are extended horizontally across her face, we can see that the golden mean is now at the edge of her eye. Across her mouth, we find the golden mean to be the crest of one side of her lips. There are a number of these proportions displayed on the face. If a face shows the golden mean proportions to a high degree, we tend to find it beautiful. If a face does not show the proportions of the golden mean, we tend to notice. So as the ancients saw this golden relationship, all throughout nature and in the human body, they tended to put it in their art as well. Whether it was consciously or subconsciously, painters and sculptors were creating works of art that aligned to the golden means patterns. Chartres Cathedral is one of the best examples of it. Everything from the floor plan to the facade of the building contain its proportions. The Parthenon from ancient Greece is an often cited example, 
And since I'm in Nashville, I have to show the reconstructed one here. In the modern day, an electronics engineer named Heinz Bolin created a musical scale based off the Fibonacci sequence. Now, there is plenty of BS relating to the golden mean and art. Just Google golden mean and art and you'll see plenty of examples of this. Just because you slap a golden spiral on any painting doesn't mean that the painting magically conforms to its proportions. Any painting, any picture, any length from one point to another will have golden sections, but that doesn't mean that the golden sections are significant. Now let's get back to the piece of music and the question that I left us with before. What is up with those major, major seventh chords? Like we said, there are three examples of them happening in this piece, in measures 8, 16, and 21. And functionally, all of these chords serve as subdominant seventh chords. The first two times this chord is presented, it's presented in third inversion, which means that the dissonant interval of a half step is presented in the closest possible voice. The third and final presentation of this harmony is in root position, with the dissonance now at the furthest possible point, almost two octaves away. Now let's take the prelude as a whole. If we count each measure as one unit, we can calculate the golden mean of the prelude. This prelude has 35 measures, so the golden mean would be in measure 21. This is where we find the major major seventh chord in root position. More so, this is also where Bach's bass line descends down to the F at the bottom of the bass clef staff. This is the lowest point in the prelude, except for the final C at the very end of the piece. These are two crucial points of Bach's structure that meet at measure 21, the golden mean section of the piece. These musical aspects reinforce Bach's structure. And if the prelude was even one measure longer or shorter, they wouldn't meet up at measure 21, the golden mean section. Like I said before, the golden mean is a repeating pattern. So if we take measure 21 and multiply that by the golden ratio, we get 12.978 and I think you'll allow me to round that up to 13. Now starting from the bar line of measure 21, and if we count backwards by 13, this brings us to measure eight. This is the golden mean of the first golden mean section back to the beginning of the prelude, where we find another one of Bach's strange harmonies. This is the golden mean of the golden mean. Now let's find that last golden mean, and I think you know where this is going. The golden mean of the section that we just calculated was 13 measures long. If we take 13 and multiply that by our golden mean, then we get eight measures. Now, if we count from the final bar line of measure eight, where our first harmony was, and we count eight more measures forward, the opposite direction of the way that we just came, we now get to measure 16. This is the final major, major seventh chord. A lot of people say, why are we counting forward and then backward and backward again? What Bach's doing, and this is brilliant, is he's creating a musical golden spiral. So at these sections where the golden mean points happen, the spiral is spiraling back in on itself. The first golden mean section modulates us to G major, the second modulates us back to C major, and then the last golden mean section highlights the temporary tonic of F major. Now there's another edition of this prelude that a lot of people don't know about called the Schwenke edition. This version has one extra measure inserted between measures 22 and 23. This measure adds a passing G in the bass to make the bass movement from F sharp to A flat less jarring. Pianist and composer Carl Czerny used this version in his edition of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Czerny believed that Bach would never write a piece of music with such an odd number of measures like 35, and that the voice leading from that F sharp to A flat was too awkward. But as we've now seen, adding just one measure or taking away one measure would completely throw off Bach's structure. So in conclusion, this is a perfect piece of music. Given the parameters that Bach has set up, there's not one thing you could add or take away to improve upon this piece. Some can argue that this analysis is a bit forced. I mean, after all, we did round up 12.97 up to 13. But given the parameters that Bach set up at the beginning, 4-4, arpeggiation, simple structure, there's not one thing that you could change that wouldn't ruin the structure of the piece. And I think it's absolutely remarkable that Bach depicted the golden spiral musically. And again, it's not just amazing that this piece has these relationships, but it's how entwined these relationships are with each other. So for example, firstly, the golden mean sections highlight all of the major major seventh chords, and that major major seventh sonority is not anywhere else in the rest of the piece. Second, all of those strange sonorities all have the same function as subdominant seventh chords. So third, the first two major major seventh chords are presented in that very tense third inversion position, which give us a taste, a hint of what it'll be like in its fully open position in the third instance of that chord. And that chord, that last presentation in measure 21, marks the bottom of the bass line descent and is followed up by a dramatic leap to the A flat in the bass with the soprano voice going down chromatically for three measures in a row. And one of my favorite moments in the piece, lastly, is the penultimate measure, 
where Bach reminds us of that remarkable dissonant seventh interval by having it as a pedal point in the bass. It's a perfect callback to the dissonances that we've been hearing throughout this whole entire piece. And all of this is done with the utmost grace and simplicity. I've often heard people talking about how they don't like looking into the biographies or analysis of pieces because they don't want the magic to be spoiled for them. And that argument never really resonated with me because I feel like the more you learn about a piece and the more you learn about a composer, the more it enriches your experience with it. I would say that isn't it helpful knowing all this information and doesn't that enrich your experience of this piece and of Bach's musical output in general? Now I need to give credit to Dr. Mike Linton who was my undergraduate music theory professor and wrote a fascinating article on this. It's more of an essay. It's about 60 pages long that's online and I'll link it below. Definitely go check it out because he goes much more in depth and he, he draws some amazing conclusions that I, that I don't really wanna spoil here, but it is so worth the watch. And so credit to him for letting me use his research in this and using some of his photos as well. So I hope that all this information helps enrich your appreciation of this piece. I find it's very important to really understand what makes a piece of art or music great. And so I hope that this encourages you to go out and find other perfect pieces of music. And I would be really curious if anyone else knows an example of a piece that they would consider perfect. See ya.